Welcome to Decoding the Creative, a show about the mental and emotional facets of the artistic mind. In this episode, we explore the burden of loss in creative endeavors, whether they're projects that fall apart or those that never materialize in the first place. But before that, we share some of our favorite pet peeves from the realms of songwriting, live performance, podcasting, fiction writing, and more. So, without further delay, this is episode three, The Band that got away. Today we're discussing the one that got away, and not when it comes to romance or dating, but instead when it comes to creative projects and endeavors. But before we get into that main subject, we're going to do a new segment called Petty Pro Pet Peeves. Say that five times fast. Petty Pro oh. Pet Peeves. <laughs> got that? So we've asked some of our creative friends for the things that really grind their gears in the world of creativity and artistry. So let's hear a few. First off, my buddy Liam Pendergrass, who has some phenomenally catchy and bluesy music on Spotify, he said that overly specific song lyrics really get under his skin. Uh, As he says, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. I think that's fantastic because I know what he's talking about. Sometimes you hear music and you're like, who are these people? What are y'all talking about? (laughs) You know? I definitely agree, man. (laughs) You're like, why are you saying this? Just say this. It's always like, uh, to me, it's always like proper nouns. Now, I'll give, I'll give Counting Crows, they get an exemption to this because they'll talk about like, you know, drove up to Hillside Manor. You're like, well, what's Hillside Manor? What are you talking about, man? That's a you know, long <laughs> December. But yeah. they can do it and nobody else can. They get the oh, yeah. permission slip. They get, a, they get a pass. Some bands do get a pass on stuff like that, but I, I can agree that that's, that's very annoying. If you if you can't discern the meaning of the lyrics, in my opinion, you, there either isn't a meaning to the lyrics because some bands just write nonsense, mm-hmm. or it's too it's too much insider info, right? Mm-hmm. How are you supposed to understand that? Yeah, it's like an inside joke, but your yeah. audience doesn't know they're, what they're the inside out. joke is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, that's great. That's, everybody loves the feeling of being left out of an inside joke. So good job, me- <laughs> good job, songwriters. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, you hit, what do you got one for me? Oh, uh, yeah, I got one for you. So um, I asked my bandmates in the Road to Milestone and immediately got a lot of them, <laughs> which was fun. Uh, one that stood out to me, which I can definitely attest to this as well. Um, when you go into the recording studio, mm-hmm. getting ready to record whatever single, whatever the case may be. But um, specifically, my bassist, Caleb, said perfecting a part in a song or just the song in general, you've played it countless times leading up to you going into the studio. As soon as they hit record, you screw the whole thing up. And for some reason you just don't know how to play it anymore, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which has happened to me before. Cause yeah. we've literally, we've had songs where we've played it at practice. We've played it at shows. I could play the darn song in my sleep. And as soon as we got into the studio and started hitting record, they were like, you know, there's another measure, right? And I'm like, you're you're right. I don't know why I forgot this. I really don't. <laughs> there's something about being on the spot, and this is true for like live recording, or you know, if you're recording or if you're doing a live performance, they're both performances. They mm-hmm. will severely impact your brain somehow. I don't I don't like understand it. I don't know if it's an anxiety thing, but it really has an impact on you. I think it's an anxiety thing with me because it's you want it to be perfect. Obviously, yeah. I mean, you're on record, but. But at the same time, so I think you start overthinking it so much that you're just your brain stops remembering yeah. the song because yeah. it's too busy focusing on not messing up. Well, and speaking of live recording, so my buddy Liam Pendergrass again, he, he hit me with a bonus petty pro pet peeve. He said that uh, people talking to him about gear and specific niche equipment ideas after he just performs that can really throw him for a loop. And he, he actually mentioned, he said, maybe it's a social anxiety thing, but I know what he means. <laughs> like the post stage brain is kind of different. Cause you're like, you're drained, right? Mm-hmm. So you play and you kind of, you leave it all on the field there on the stage. And then as soon as you get off some of those conversations that happen after you get off the stage, your brain's not ready for it yet. You're not ready. Oh, to talk definitely. To, you're not ready to talk about like PA equipment or like guitar effects pedals. You're just not ready for it. Oh, well, that's what I've loved about being a drummer. Because to be completely honest, and it's not that I don't like fans of my band's music. Obviously, I love it. And, I'm, right. you know, it's not that I'm trying to be a grouch. But I do love that when I get off stage, most of the time, I'm not the one that people want to talk to after the show. Yeah. <laughs> That's just <laughs> traditionally just being the drummer. I'm, just, I'm not the guy that you go and talk to. So yes. 
I have always loved that for the most part, minus, you know, the band people in the back, for the most part, I can just get off stage and kind of go do my own thing and relax and kind of decompress. Because even if I sat at the merch table, which I've done, I've sat at the merch table and I've had just, you know, people come up and they buy stuff and they come talk to the band. Yeah. And they're like, hey, what's going on? Hey. And then they move right along. And I'm like, I could just not be here. I'm just going to go do something else. Yeah. So Where I, I get a little bit of a pass on that. So, but I do see how that would be annoying as well. Yeah. That, that's a little exhausting. All right. Hit me with another pet peeve. Oh, all right. I got another one for you. So, in the booking world, which um, as of before COVID happened, I was a part of a booking endeavor with my buddy Cody Frayne who is the drummer for Ascent Like Wolves. I mentioned their new record in our last episode, but me and him came together. We were doing some um, some shows here in the Lancaster area. Learned a ton from this dude. He is the man when it comes to booking shows and just nice. that stuff in general. So, But one thing that I love that me and him share the frustration with is we he would send out um, detailed list basically, you know, a set sheet of what, how the whole night was going to go for every single band, yeah. send it out to them a week ahead of time, a week, mind you, where to go, the address, where to park, when to get there, the set, how it was going to go, this, that, the other, super detailed. I kid you not, we send it out a week ahead of time. What do you think happens the day before the show? Every single band hitting you up, emailing you, texting you, hey, what's the address for the venue? Oh. Hey, what time are we supposed to be there? Hey, are we, what, where are we at in the lineup? And it was just infuriating because yeah, <laughs> you're just like, what did we even do this for? Come right. on. Why did you even give me an email or a phone number to t- yeah. send this to? So I, I slaved over this Excel spreadsheet for nothing. Exactly. Come on. This is tw- this was 25 minutes wasted. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. It's, it's interesting. That's uh. I'm telling you, musicians are just a different type. I got one from I got another one from the non-musical world. So my buddy Alex Courtright, he hosts a, a cultural critique podcast called The Courtright Cast on YouTube and Spotify. He says his pet peeve is unedited raw audio for digital recordings and things like that. And I just want to say to our listeners, you have no idea how many coughs and sneezes and weird sounds I have edited out of these recordings. So, oh, I can only imagine. I feel like I've had a perpetual cold for the past three weeks, and it always gets really bad when we start recording. So my apologies on the editing you have to spend time doing. <laughs> well, and it's always like, I think there's a fine line with like podcast. People in this digital age, because of the pandemic, people are recording over Zoom. They're recording over other kinds of weird long-distance type operations. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be good enough. Yeah, I mean, it can't like, be annoying. Yeah, if it's too bad, it's like not worth putting up. So there's a, mm-hmm. there's a fine line there. He added another bonus one um, about a lack of enthusiasm in digital recordings of, of speaking. He basically, he said, and this is almost like a pro tip from him, that you have to add some additional exaggerated enthusiasm that you normally wouldn't do. You can't just speak normally. Like when you watch a YouTube video of somebody talking, it's almost like a broadcaster, right? You see, mm-hmm. like, a, like, remember the news anchors of yesteryear where they had to, like, really over-exaggerate because otherwise people just couldn't connect with their enthusiasm. Oh, very true. When I was uh, doing music videos uh, for The Road to Milestone, I didn't realize when the guy came in, he was you know, setting everything up, kind of going over the ground rules. He's like, all right, when you play drums, I want you to play drums like you would live, but I need you to over-exaggerate what you're doing. Yeah. So that way it translates on camera. So when you see most of the time when you see a band playing on stage, those big, those big, you know, moments where they're just slinging around and playing, they're super over exaggerating them because, you know, that's kind of what you have to do in that world. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, which was interesting. I didn't know you had to do that. So I was like, Oh, good yeah, figure. I never would have thought of that at all. All right. So let's, let's end this with one, one of ours. Each. Okay. So I'll give you one Sounds and I want to hear from, from you. So we've talked about music. We've talked about live performance. We've talked about podcasting and broadcasting. I'm going to hit you with one from the world of like writing fiction and, and storytelling. Okay. I am over the dramatic reveal of people being parents or in a relationship. Like that whole, in every story, it's like, oh, but they were brothers. They were oh. cousins. I don't care. I just don't care anymore. <laughs> so, like, look, Darth Vader said he was 
he was Luke's father. After that, shut it down. That was yeah. Cool. Like, he topped it off, and we're, yeah. we're done with the whole I am your father reveal. We got mm-hmm. it. We're shutting that down. That whole operation and, is done. And I, I, see, I, see, I see what avenue you're going down, and I definitely agree, because I do feel like there's certain parts of a certain movie that have been rehashed. Oh, absolutely. At, like, just with just different names. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. Oh, wait, I did, because you did that already. So yeah, everybody, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, everybody in every piece of fiction is related, I feel like. Uh, like and you see two people in a, in a movie or TV show, at some point, they're going to fake out this cheap shot where they're like, and they were related. Oh, my <laughs> God. Who cares? I don't care. Right? Oh, you're very true, man. That makes me laugh, because that is... I've seen. I'm now. I'm thinking about all the movies that I've seen that have done that, and it's a lot. <laughs> so let me let me hear one of your pet peeves. All right. So this one is. I hope I don't offend any former friends or current friends that I have they'll who get are drummers. It. But I, yeah, they'll get over it. But so one of the most infuriating, and I mean infuriating things to me. I'll never show it, but if you are ever at a show with me or ever a part of a show with me, and you see this happen, look at my face, and you'll see. Just so much hope lost in the humanity when this happens. So bands just finished playing. Most bands and musicians know that in 99% of shows, the amount of time that the band after they play versus when the next band plays, that that transition time of equipment and sound check and whatever, most of the time super minimal. Probably in my case, I've seen an average... 10 to 15, maybe, maybe 20 minutes if you're really, really lucky. But usually it's like 10 minutes. I cannot stand when a drummer is going to tear his, take his kit off the stage. And for whatever reason, I still don't know why they do it. I've never cared to ask because I've been so angry in the moment. (laughs) They decide to take their cymbals off of the stands and put them in their cymbal bag on the stage before they take their anything off. And me, yeah. as the next drummer about to play, have to sit there Why and wait you? for this dude to take his or woman. We'll be we'll, all across the board. I've seen it happen. Take their take their symbols down, and I'm like, "Why are you doing that? Like, do it in the back. Yeah. And what I, does it matter? <laughs> I will agree with that. And I'll say, like, any kind of live performance setup and teardown is just a monumental pet peeve on my pet peeve board. Like, I know we talk about it, we joke about it all the time. Mm-hmm. Like. If you're playing some kind of like two-bit local show, which I've played many, I've played at Mexican restaurants, I've played at pizza parlors. Like, mm-hmm. if you were playing that, and there's like four or five bands, you should be unloading and loading your stuff onto stage and off stage in like five minutes. Yeah, there's no reason. There's no reason not to. Do not set your stuff up for 45 minutes. No, nope, because you no. Nope. You got to keep the audience's attention, and you're killing the audience because they're gonna step outside, smoke a cigarette, and leave because you're taking too long. So. That's, mm-hmm. That that's a big pet peeve of mine. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you. And if any drummer wants to comment on here defending why they take their cymbals down I'll off the stage, why. I don't care. I don't care. I feel yeah. that strongly about it. <laughs> Do not email us about that. No, uh, don't email us about it. That's amazing. All right, so on to the main subject of of today. We're talking about the one that got away, or rather, the band that got away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think a lot of musicians have this emotional feeling of of missing an opportunity. And this can be either a band they used to be in and it broke up, but they really felt like that was the one. That was the one that was going to make it, right? Mm-hmm. And then I think there's other facets of that. I think that sometimes you can also feel a sense of loss about an opportunity you never had in the first place. Maybe you tried out for a band and you didn't get the part. Maybe you wanted to finish this project and it never happened at all. And this, this is not even just musical in nature. This is true for everyone. There can be a one that got away. And I think that can be a really painful thing and a difficult thing to process, you know, in your own life. Oh, yeah. I definitely agree with that. I have experienced this feeling um, a lot. I've been in several different musical projects as a drummer, just from traveling from North Carolina and then living in D.C., um, and then going to Pennsylvania after that, you know, I've been in a ton of projects, man. So, um, and you've, you've seen all the different ones I've been in. So I've definitely had a lot of moments where I was like, man, this is it. This is the one. Yeah. And then it didn't happen for various reasons. Um, sometimes it was me, you know, moving or leaving. I know there was a couple of bands that I left 
and it was me. Like I was leaving. I was like, Hey, I want to leave. I want to move to DC. I want to move to Pennsylvania. Yeah. And you know, the band's, the band's still kicking it. And you know, in some instances, the band is still kicking it and doing it. In some instances they're not, but it's definitely happened a lot. And it was a whirlwind of emotions when I had those feelings. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that one of the lessons I've learned, so this will be a little more personal for us. So Mm-hmm. You, and, you and I, for all the listeners out there who don't know, you and I played in a, like a post-hardcore band called The Avenger, which came out before The Avengers, mind you. So I just want to put that out there. Yes, uh, yes. The, the Avenger. Very important. We, we did that, and it really dominated our high school time and our young adult time after high school. You know, we played in it, I don't even know what years, maybe 2005 to 2009 or 10. We went on tour. Our first tour was the summer of 2008. Because I had just graduated early high school, and yeah. you, the first date, I think, you went to prom, wasn't it? Was it graduation or prom? It was graduation. So yeah, graduation. I, I went from yeah. graduation to our first tour show. So yeah, that just, that's what it was. And that just really goes to show you how that, that band we shared in together, The Avenger, really dominated our adolescence and young adulthood. And so then when you lose something like that, it's a particular kind of loss that like no one ever teaches you how to process, right? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I definitely, I definitely agree. That band was pivotal for me uh, personally, and I know for you, me and you grew, you know, immensely through our personal one-on-one friendship. But we also, outside of just me and you, you know, the different various members that we had in the band, and the couple that were, you know, staples in the band with me and you as well. We, you know, that shaped a lot of how I view the music business, how I view yeah. being in a band, how I view just operating as a creative person in general. And I also learned how to work with other creative people, some that were just super head against the wall, you know, frustrating, <laughs> you know, to work with. But um, I definitely, that, you know, me and you's time in the Avenger, I would say was the first time after, you know, it kind of dissolved where I felt like, man, that was the one that got away. You know, that was the first band that I really felt that way. Yeah. And I think that one of my main lessons learned from from that and also from other experiences um, is learning how to grieve and mourn for things that aren't humans. You know, we know mm-hmm. that if somebody leaves your life or somebody dies in your you know life that we know how to grieve and mourn them. We know that's normal, but actually I would argue that it's very normal to grieve and mourn losses that aren't humans, right? Mm -hmm. They're people, they're concepts. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, that another thing that for me personally, I've had to like learn how to, to grieve is I, you know, I used to run a lessons business back in uh, Greenville, North Carolina, where we used to live and it was very Mm -hmm. thriving and, and it was hard work and it was a tough schedule, but I did love it because I just love teaching music in general and so then, of course, we relocated and, and not having that and really not being able to launch it again just for logistical reasons. I've had to learn how to grieve that loss in a sense because it did. It was a meaning. It was a source of meaning in my life. And so I think learning to grieve and mourn your losses when it comes to creative ambitions or endeavors is a really tricky lesson to learn. How would you say, I'll pose this to you, how would you say that the grieving process I know how it was for me, but how did grieving, let's say, the dissolution of the Avenger as being an important project in your life, how did you go about that? Because you got to admit, when I left, you know, just brief backstory, you know, I left and then you and Alex continued on a little bit longer after I left. How, what were your emotions like? Did you feel like you knew it was coming to an end and that you were going to have to get used to something outside of this? Um, I think it's hard for me to put my brain into that person because it was so long ago. Yeah, yeah, obviously. There's, there's, there's a certain distance of time where you can no longer vouch for like your teenage brain or your early 20 something's brain. It's hard to vouch for what you're thinking then. But I think that. When you haven't reached a certain maturity level, you can always feel like this is your last stop and you're running out of time. It's kind of like if you're in a band and that band breaks up, you always have this feeling like, well, that was it. That was my last chance. That was the mm-hmm. last stop on this train, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's almost like an existential dread. So you have, to, you have to adjust that to some extent because you have to recognize, like, you know, there's always a tomorrow. There's always another opportunity. So this idea that 
the next time you lose something is the last time. I think mm-hmm. that's a very dangerous way to think. Um, but I think a lot of people do feel that way because they musicians always feel like they're up against some like hidden clock where they're they're racing against time to make something of themselves or they never will, right? Oh yeah. I definitely think that my well then I would say my thinking was kind of along in the same vein as yours. You know, obviously I can't, you know, put together exactly what all, you know, mentally I was going through back then because obviously we were super young and not, <laughs> you know, going through emotions properly at that time but i know generally i did have that feeling of this was it like i put so much time into this this is what i spent yeah what three four years doing and this is what i at that point had had the biggest opportunities with and what was i going to do without it how was i going to process not having that in my life anymore and for me it was really i can distinctly remember being severely you know, depressed and lost feeling because I was like, I'm giving this up, Yeah. but I feel like I'm giving it up for a reason, but I just didn't know what that reason at the time was, Yeah. Uh, but it still was traumatic, super traumatic. Yeah. And I will say like the, there was a phase where after the Avenger, our, our hardcore project, I just didn't do anything. And that mm-hmm. I think is, I think that moment of not being busy can be very purifying, but it's also very daunting for creative folks. You know, creative folks tend to stay busy. They always have like at least one thing going. Mm-hmm. And so when you suddenly have nothing and you're just, you're just alone, it's just you now, you have to do a lot of soul searching because you have to look in the mirror because otherwise staying busy can keep you from ever just slowing down and thinking about what's going on. Right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. I, I agree with that. I mean, I came... I came out a better person through that ending. You know, I, I, I gained knowledge, I gained insight into how to handle that feeling. You know, after some time dealing with it and battling with it, I did eventually gain some insight on how to cope with it when it happens again, which it did happen again in other projects, but also realizing, hey, this is a part of being a creative person. You're going to feel this. and. Yep you know, what are you going to do to deal with it when it happens? Yeah, I I think that also a big part of this is realizing that we tend to idealize things in a way that doesn't necessarily match reality without knowing what could have happened in a negative light, too. I mean, if you're in any given band or something and they break up, you can idealize and romanticize, like, what if we stayed together and everything would have been amazing? We rode off into the sunset. But in reality, you know, a band could stay together one more year and some other drama could happen, some mm-hmm. other crisis could happen, or it could just, uh, could just die a, a natural death, so to speak. So I think that's a lesson I learned was trying to adjust your perspective to something more reasonable instead of romanticizing what could have been because what mm-hmm. could have been in your mind is not necessarily what would have been, right? Oh, definitely. Because if you look at it being realistic now, I don't think... Had the had our band the adventure not ended when it did, I don't think I think realistically we probably would have went maybe recorded another record, put it out, and then just with ev- what everybody was doing individually at the time, you know, starting families, getting married, and getting into that aspect of life, and really like we talked about last episode, putting the personal life a little bit more so at the forefront. Yeah, I think the adventure would have eventually ended up, you know, coming to an end anyway. It's just, it happened, I think, sooner than it would have had it kept going and not happened the way it did. But yeah, and anytime you invest a lot of time and energy into something like like a band or a music project, or, or really, even if you're just like running your own business, um, you can always feel a sense of loss, like, man, I put all that time and money into it for nothing. But in reality, you had a good run. That's, mm-hmm. that's the, I think, the mental adjustment is mm-hmm. like, um, success is not just lasting forever. Like it can also be, we had a good five year stint, a good seven year stint. We had a good run. I mean, that's how I feel about my music lessons. Like, man, I had a good run for like eight solid years. So Mm -hmm. just because it didn't last 10 years or just because it didn't last my entire life doesn't mean it's a total loss. I have to adjust and realize that like everything is going to have it's in the point and you have to have grace and you have to have balance to not just, you know, mourn the fact that it didn't last forever. Cause that's not really a reasonable take, right? It's not. If you look at it, that was one thing that I 
had to come to terms with and learned over the years, you know, you have to, you have to appreciate the moments that you did have, whether they're playing Madison Square Garden or it was playing your, you know, high school reunion. (laughs) You know, appreciate what you did, appreciate, you know, what you learned out of it. Because even if you look at the most famous artists, painters, writers, you know, performers, actors, musicians, whatever, even if they get big, yeah. Look at how hard it is to maintain that level of success right. for a long period of time. So you have to, as a creative person, unfortunately come to that reality that it might feel like it was something that got away from you and you're never going to achieve it. But, you know, you have to appreciate what you did do and what you did accomplish. Yeah, And I think that I think all these lessons also apply. They apply to the one that got away, the band that mm-hmm. got away. But they also apply to the one that never was like mm-hmm. you may have had a creative idea, an idea to start this new project, start this new business, start writing this novel. And it got away from you. Uh, or like I said, I think a common thing is people try out for, uh, you know, either they'll audition for something like uh, an acting gig or they'll audition for, you know, a band, and they won't get it. And then they'll have to wrestle with what could have been because this was the project that never was. They never got to it at all. And I think that can mm-hmm. be really tough, too. Oh, I've, I feel you on that because I have tried out for uh, projects, and I think I was super cocky throughout my 20s. I didn't, you know, like to show it. I didn't want to act like I was cocky, but deep down inside, I knew I was a good drummer. So when I had that first gig that I didn't get, you know, I tried out for it and it was like, yo, sorry, but we found someone else that fits a little bit better than you. That was big for me. Cause I was like, are you kidding me? This, this, I was a shoe in for this. Right, and then it changes fun. your whole, you know, now it changes your whole plan and your whole mentality for a good little bit. <laughs> yeah, and that messes you up if you spend your days going, if I had just gotten accepted into mm-hmm. that program, if I had just gotten into that band, when, again, the same the same idea applies. We idealize and we romanticize when, when you could have joined that band or you could have joined that project or gotten that gig, and then a year later it could have nosedived or you could have hated every minute of it. Like, we idealize that the, the path not taken. Uh-huh. Without uh-huh. realizing the the baggage that could have come along with it. And I think remi- like that has been a big part for me, recognizing the reality of it outside of the romance of it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard to separate the two um, because the romanticizing of it all is the fun part to pay attention right. to, and that's the attractive element to it. But the reality, you know, is what you have to pay attention to, and... It's a sad reality sometimes, but I I feel like once you grasp onto it, us as creative people, once we get used to, let's say, the heartbreak of a band or a project not coming to fruition, yeah. it makes us better people. Um, because in like in human relationships, you know, you go through a breakup and you're sad for a little bit. You're bummed, obviously. That was an important part of your life, and you spent a lot of time invested in it. Yeah, but you start having those moments after where you start noticing what you learned from it and you go, Hey, well now I know what to look for next time this comes along. And I think that happens for us in our creative endeavors. When we have the one that got away per se, like in the adventure, I knew, I knew what to look for. I I guess I learned early warning signs of toxic things that could happen amongst a band. And, and I learned how to maybe nip it in the bud before it became a big thing because we, you know, we had seen it happen with other members in our previous project. And so I kind of learned little lessons from it, but I think that's a necessary part of it. The reality is you're going to get in those situations, but take the little learning lessons that you get from it after you mourn and grieve, you know, cope with it by improving yourself and equipping yourself to better handle it for the next time it happens. Oh, I totally agree. And I also think, so, so with this, we have we have the one that got away. Mm-hmm. We have the one that never was, you know, something mm-hmm. you tried out for and didn't get. And then I think we have a third tier in all this, which is the one that weighs you down. I think sometimes we invest a lot of value and meaning into projects that are not viable or mm-hmm. they're not good for us, and we feel compelled to stick with them, even if it kills us, right? And so we have, mm-hmm. to, we have to learn to let go of some of those things because I've seen it like, 
whether it's a project idea, a writing project, anything, it can drive you crazy when in reality you should learn to let go of some things because they are truly toxic for you. And that's a hard lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's for real hard lesson to learn because you don't want to have to admit that part of your creativity is bad for you, I think. Yeah. Um, It reveals that part of being a creative person that, hey, sometimes your focus in being a creative person, you can end up in turn focusing on something that is detrimental to your personal life or your work life or your mental health or something like that. I, I used it as a distraction to, like I said previously, you know, not pay attention to things I should be paying attention to in my life. Right. right. And, you know, that, that I would say that's where they were, you know, they weighed on me a bunch, not necessarily that they were taking up my time or they were draining me of any money, but they were more so I was using them as very, very big distractions that I was really good at playing in my mind the scene of, Hey, don't worry. You know, we can handle this, this part. We'll, it, we'll, we'll figure it out. But right now we got to focus on this. This is what's going to, this is what's going to help you get in the mindset and the mood to handle this other thing. But then what happens? I never got in the mindset or the mood to handle my personal situation. I was just using it as a distraction. So I'd say that's the big way that, you know, it's weighed on me as, you know, as a, as different projects oh. have gone along. No, I totally agree. I think that, um, Creative projects can be a form of escapism for people, and a little bit of escapism. There's a debate about whether is that good, is it bad. You know, people use people use TV and movies as a form of escapism, and to some extent that has value. But I think that yeah, I think for some people they treat their creative enterprises as a form to escape, maybe not dealing with their problems, maybe uh, you know, getting help for issues they have. They just escape into their fantasies, right? Never to mm-hmm. return. And I do think it's tricky because, you know, learning how to let go of the projects that weigh you down, it's all about viability. Now, if you're running a business, if you're running a business, you own a store or something, viability is easy to measure because it's like, look, if we're in the red for three months or we're in the red for six months and we're not making any money, this business idea is not viable. And even then, a lot of people run businesses in the red. They lose money because they don't want to let go of this idea they had. Mm -hmm. The musicians and other creative people, they don't even have any way of measuring viability. They're like pouring their heart and soul into something that's truly not viable, but they can't let it go. Right. No. Yeah. I mean, how many, how many stories have you heard of, you know, someone in the creative arts and they've been in doing, they've been grinding it out for like what, 10 years, all of a sudden the right person was there and they ended up becoming, you know, a millionaire the next day because they just had that one opportunity. It unfortunately just took them 10 years to get there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it, I think that's a, it's a very tricky, um, you know, kind of ball of yarn to detangle when it comes to viability and how much time is enough time to give to a creative venture that is not serving you well. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would say to creative people out there, um, if when you when you approach this situation where you feel like you have a project that's weighing you down and maybe it's becoming a distraction to you, um, maybe it's taking your you know you taking your attention away from something else that you should be doing, or maybe it is something that's financially draining you. I've been in those situations where I've had members of projects where I'm just like, why are why are you pouring this money into this? Yeah. You know, this is what this is causing a stress to this project because there's just you shouldn't be doing this, but whatever. I th- I would say to creatives, you know, when you get in those spots, don't be afraid to confront it and, you know, come to that realization. It's going to take you some time. And it'll, yeah. it, with me, it took several kind of come to Jesus moments, you know, as a metaphor um, where I had to really sit down and, you know, observe myself and go, hey, man, me and you need to talk because I think this is something that you shouldn't be doing right now. And as much as your creative soul and being wants to do it, you don't need to do it because it's really hindering you from enhancing A, B, or C. So don't be afraid to confront it, as scary as it is. And also don't be afraid to have friends that will call you out on it yeah. and or people in your life that are really good at you know telling you you need to do that because sometimes you need that little push too. So Yeah, it's hard to have perspective when you are in the moment. You, know, mm-hmm. you may be working mm-hmm. on even just as something as simple as a song, a four-minute song, Mm-hmm. And you can't have the objective perspective as to 
the value of it or the meaning of it or the viability of it because you're too close to it. And that's true for even bigger projects. You're working on an album. You're working on a novel. You have to find a way to step back, even if you have to have other voices in your life, a way to step back and get some perspective because you're too close to it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would ask you, though, with all that we've talked about, would you would you do most of what you did all over again? And if you wouldn't, is there anything about how you've handled some of the situations where you felt like a project got away or just didn't come to fruition or you know didn't get out into the world the way you wanted to? Would you handle it the same way because you know what benefits came from it now? Or would you have switched something up just to see what would have happened? I think for me, I would have done a lot different. I mean, I, I think about all the all the various projects I've had, some of them bands, some of them other things. Um, some of them worked and some of them absolutely failed. There were, you know, it depends. Um, some of those mm-hmm. projects that were, I can recognize were never viable and I should have never done them at all. And then okay. There, so- and, and then there's others where I would have... I would have done them, but I would have done them differently. And of course, it's hard. It's it's easy to say that now that I'm a, a kind of a different person. Mm-hmm. But how much could 19 year old me or 20 year old me have had the insight and the clarity I have now? It would have been very difficult. But in it depends. It depends on the project. Some of them I would have done differently. Some of them I would have avoided altogether. Gotcha. And, and regardless of all that, I try to just accept my path as I've taken it, which is, I think is very hard, right? It's very hard to Mm -hmm. just realize you can't change the past and then find acceptance in spite of your, you know, your incapacity to make change to your past. You have to learn to just accept, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. There you go. The fantasy of wishing you could change something that's not possible to change. I think it's cool to think about, you know, it's cool. What if I had done this? (laughs) Yeah. I think you can get lost into that thought exercise and it's very it's very perilous for you emotionally and mentally right yeah yeah I think overall I'm blessed to and privileged to have just really gotten the insight and knowledge that I gained over the course of time with different projects not working out or spending time doing things that I just shouldn't have put as much time into I learned a lot of uh, wisdom through it all and I think it's wisdom that I've hopefully been able to articulate to other people, friends and family and, you know, apply it not just to the creative world, but, you know, translate it into other aspects of my personal and work life. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it'd be in a perfect world. It'd be cool to, you know, not waste, have wasted my time on certain things. But at the end of the day, I definitely think it was good for it to have happened the way it did. I know my relationships with different people ended that probably should have went ahead and ended and some that you know it came back and it came back stronger because of the the working working out of different things through that time so i think it all worked out the way it should have which was neat yeah either way here we are and we have to accept the moment we're exactly no matter if i didn't like it i just have to suck it up anyway (laughs) right that's true that's true um you know it's always like the kind of recap in my own mind what we discuss in the mm-hmm. episode you know we talked about the one that got away with the capacity to grieve and to mourn something that's not a person but instead a concept um, we talked about the the one that never was right and how we we can idealize the opportunities we didn't get and we can romanticize the ideas we we didn't see come to fruition and then you have projects that weigh you down things you should cut out bands you should quit right different things mm-hmm. like that I always like to end our episodes with kind of a final affirmation for creative people. And and the affirmation for me uh, today is this, you know, creative people, you have permission to let go of the projects or the ideas that weigh you down. You have the right to grieve lost opportunities and you have the power to see your past in a new and balanced light. That's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. I would say my affirmation for creative people out there is, you know, go out there, obviously express your creativity Get your projects out into the world. But like you mentioned, Ray, you know, don't be afraid to get rid of the things that are weighing you down. Don't be afraid to embrace the things that you might be a little scared to put a little bit more time in. And just overall, live in your creativity, but also take away some of the failures that you might have along the way. So that way you can make the future of it more balanced with the rest of your life and make you a happier person altogether.
And that's it. Thanks for tuning in this week. Our logo design was made by Dana Gray Studio. Our intro music was made by me. My co-host Ben Evans is in a band called The Road to Milestone and another band called Avery. Check them out on Spotify. And connect with us. You can email us at decodingthecreative at gmail.com or you can follow us on social media, Decoding the Creative on Instagram or DTC underscore podcast on Twitter. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon.